You ever come up with an idea that sounds good on paper, but it doesn't dawn on you just how wrong you were until you're knee deep in it? That was me. Somehow, I got it in my head that it would be awesome to ask my friends what some of the worst anime they've ever seen were so that I could watch it and review it myself. That was mistake number one. Most of my friends just listed a bunch of shows they didn't personally like, but not things that could be considered objectively bad. However, there was one friend that suggested a little title called King's Game. I'd never heard of it, and she isn't the type to throw out a nonsense answer, so I was intrigued enough to sit down and watch it. That was mistake number dos. Let me add that I was further intrigued by the fact that it's listed and advertised as a horror slash psychological thriller. <laughs> King's Game is neither of those things. I don't care what anyone says. Anyway, I gathered some snacks, started the first episode, and thought to myself, this should be fun. That was mistake number C. By the time the anime was over, I was both insanely annoyed and absolutely baffled that this script went through so many people and not one of them thought, uh, guys, maybe we should do a few more passes over this? It's, uh, it's looking a little rough. I was also thankful that this monstrosity only clocks in at a merciful 12 episode run. I'd fallen victim to the sunk cost fallacy near the halfway mark of the show. I told myself that I'd already wasted so much time on it that I may as well see it through to the end. As is usually the case when making videos, I sat down to re-watch King's Game so that I could take notes and have it fresh in my mind. This was a painful task, and even the length of the season that I literally just praised for being merciful the first time around felt like climbing Mount Everest on the second rodeo. But what makes King's Game such a chore to get through? I'm glad you asked so that I have an excuse to rant about it. Normally this would be the point where I'd throw up the obligatory spoiler warning, but there's really no point in watching this anime unless you like spending every second of your free time being annoyed. It might make for a solid drinking game if you took a shot every time the show made you laugh unintentionally at how bad it is, or completely pissed you off with how bad it is. Though a trip to the hospital would make for a great reason to stop watching. Before we begin, I just want to say thank you guys for watching, and please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. All of these things really push the algorithm to recommend my content to more people. And yes, for those of you that came from the Dark Tournament video, the Chapter Black video is being worked on. In order to give you the full context of why I hate this show so much, we do have to start with the wall it runs into, which is that it suffers from the same disease as Sword Art Online. I know that'll ruffle a few feathers, but let me explain. Remember the very first episode of SAO? Remember how exciting it was to watch the premise get established? We watch a bunch of people that are thrilled to play this brand new experience only to get trapped in a death game. The implications were chilling and there was a noticeable tone shift that really hammered home the gravity of the situation the characters were all in. The stakes were set and we were left to wonder what challenges awaited, who would live, and who would die. In a way, King's Game hits very similar story beats to that in its pilot episode, but the execution is a bit rockier. The original story for King's Game is broken up into six parts. King's Game, Extreme, Spiral, Origin, Annihilation, and Abyss. The anime follows the events of the first two parts, while giving nods to Spiral, Origin, and Annihilation at a few small moments. I'm going to run you guys through the first episode real quick so you guys can see what I mean. It's not a flawless episode by any means. There are more than enough red flags to make you question why you're here, kind of like when you noticed all the red flags in your ex but you dated them anyway. Our main character is Nobuaki, who I'm just going to call Nobu for simplicity's sake. He's a pretty bland guy and he's a bit of a loner at his new school. His classmates try to get to know him better but he's like, nah fam, can't you see him trying to be traumatized? Another of our primary characters, a chick named Natsuko, takes a liking to Nobu and tries to bring him out of his shell a bit. Nobu's classmates celebrate his transfer into their class during an upcoming sports festival. No, not that one. He has a pretty fun time and once he's home alone, he reflects on the day, wondering when the last time he truly had fun was. The thought is interrupted by a text from someone identified only as the king, and every student in class receives the same message. The king's game has officially begun. The rules are simple, participation is mandatory for those selected, the king's orders are absolute, and the target or targets of the order have 24 hours to carry them out, and lastly, withdrawal from the game is strictly prohibited. There's also an unspoken rule, but we'll get to that later. The game is played like this. At midnight every night until the conclusion of the game, the king will send the same text to every living participant, so everyone will always know what that day's tasks are and who is being ordered to do what. Tasks come in three forms individual, shared, and group tasks. Individual tasks usually affect just one person, shared tasks affect at least two people, and group tasks have to be completed or obeyed by the entire class. 
Then there's the second portion of that structure, obedience and punishment. For individual and shared orders, when a player does what they are tasked with, every player receives a message confirming the obedience of that player. An example of an individual task would be, Saturn has to do a backflip. That task could only be carried out by me, and failure to complete it would affect me and me alone. An example of a shared task would be something like, Saturn and Zoran have to high-five each other. That task would have to be consciously carried out by the both of us, so if I kicked the bucket before completing the task, Zoran wouldn't be able to complete it, and technically he'd fail even if he gave my corpse the best high-five imaginable. For group tasks, depending on the game, obedience is either confirmed individually or as a group. Obedience for these events isn't confirmed until the players complete whatever task they were assigned. There's simultaneously a bit more flexibility and rigidity in the group tasks depending entirely on what the narrative needs to happen, so don't concern yourself with these. The game clock resets at midnight, and if a task isn't completed by then, punishment comes. Punishment is usually death with maybe two exceptions, and comes to anyone and everyone who failed to do what they were told, or as a direct result of one of the group games. Rule breakers are punished immediately though. The first task of the show goes to Nobu. He receives an order that he has to kiss Natsuko sometime in the next 24 hours. From Nobu's reaction and a scene from the very beginning of the episode that I skipped over entirely, we're made to understand that he's participated in the King's Game before, hence his reluctance to make friends and his horrified response to the King's Game starting up. The next day, his classmates give him shit because they think he was the one that sent the message based on some unspoken crush on Natsuko. Nobu tries to explain to them that the King's Game is real, but they just laugh at him. However, when he tries to reinforce that he isn't lying, they all get strangely hostile towards him, which was the first red flag for me. Characters' emotions flip at the drop of a dime, and it yanked me right out of what was otherwise a tense moment. Nobu shows his frustration at their lack of belief, alluding to the events of the first King's Game he survived and how his former classmates didn't take it seriously either until they suffered their first casualties. He kind of mopes on the roof and resigns himself to death, deciding that doing so will be evidence his classmates need to recognize the threat they were facing. Since his task included Natsuko, she'd be punished for failing too, though Nobu figures that if they're just going to suffer and die anyway, it's better to die first. That kind of thinking goes to show just how hopeless Nobu feels about the situation, as well as a twisted and pretty bleak sense of compassion he feels for his classmates and Natsuko. Despite his willingness to kick the bucket, Natsuko finds and kisses him while his guard is down just before midnight. This resolves their portion of the King's game for the time being and moves it to the next round, much to Nobu's horror. Once midnight rolls around, new orders come barreling in from the king, giving individual and shared tasks to a large swath of the classroom. There's also a group task that comes in stating that no one in class is permitted to do anything unnecessary, whatever that means, and no one in the class is permitted to get deep rest. This wave of orders effectively drags the entire class into the game all at once, placing them all on the chopping block in some form or fashion. However, with the text coming in at midnight, many of Nobu's classmates are already asleep and thus have technically disobeyed the king's orders. Students start dropping like flies, and I definitely wasn't a fan of those players being punished retroactively, but it speaks to a wider problem that we'll also get to later. Nobu tries to explain the danger they're all in to his classmates after Natsuko gathers those who weren't yet asleep in the park. Another character speaks up about discovering a friend dead when she was on her way to the park, finally cementing the threat for the class. At that point, Nobu reveals that he's played the King's Game before, and almost immediately, another female character takes that revelation and spins it so far out of context, saying that because Nobu both knew the punishment of disobeying the King and also refused to kiss Natsuko that he was actively trying to murder her? The first time I watched this show, I was baffled that that was the first place the character would jump to with that information. It plays heavily into another huge issue with this series. Characters make leaps in logic that would make Olympic gold medalists envious, and nearly everyone demonstrates a complete lack of critical thinking skills. The rest of the class misinterprets Nobu's intention, and weirdly, Nobu doesn't even bother trying to explain himself for some reason. The students then begin to think that Nobu's the one responsible for the text, which I guess is perfectly logical considering the existence of texting apps, but definitely wouldn't explain how he would have managed to zip around town like the Flash and covertly kill every one of their sleeping classmates in the time it took him to receive the message and arrive at the park. They could have also just replied to the king and if Nobu's phone went off, mystery solved, but they don't do that. So what do they do, you might be asking? 
they proceed to beat his ass, which, you know, wouldn't be my first choice in response to the only guy that actually knows what's going on. The guy leading the aggressive response receives a punishment from the king, probably for disobeying the order against unnecessary actions, but it's, it's such a vague thing and we'll get into that later. He dies a pretty gruesome death, and then the episode ends. You see what I mean about the first episode being just intriguing enough to incite a bit of curiosity? It's not nearly as narratively strong as the first episode of SAO, but there's enough promise there outside of the red flags to convince yourself to see where it goes. If I had to grade it based on the premise alone, I would give it a B-, minus. but if we take the premise out of it and judge it as a whole, it, it'd get like a, like a D plus, C-, minus if I'm being generous. So if I was feeling the episode that much based on the premise, what went wrong? Well... In order to properly convey to you why the show is such a train wreck, I need to break this section up into smaller bullet points, otherwise I'll just end up screaming into my microphone and jumping from topic to topic for the next billion years. Some of these issues weave in and out of each other, which is what makes this series so frustrating in general, and it's what makes trying to structure this video pretty much futile, but I'm going to do my best, starting with the pacing and characters. The pacing of King's Game is hindered horrifically by one thing, the story's structure. You see, King's Game covers the events of two separate instances of the titular game with Nobu at the center of each, and like I mentioned before, it has to cover these separate events over the span of a meager 12 episodes. But if someone asked you how you'd tell the story, I'm sure you would say something along the lines of, you start with the first game, and you move to the second, right? Yeah, that's what you'd assume, but the anime begins with Nobu's second King's Game. From this point forward, for the sake of clarity, I'm just going to refer to Nobu's first game as Game 1, and the game taking place in present day as Game 2. For some unfathomable reason, the series starts with Game 2, and the story regarding Game 1 is told through flashbacks. Flashbacks don't sound so bad, right? Under normal circumstances, I'd agree with you, but Game 2, which is the A plot, frequently spends entire episodes taking a back seat to Game 1, which is the B plot. Sometimes it's literally taking the back seat. This puts the show in a weird position in regard to the principal characters of Game 2 because so much time is spent with the characters from Game 1. There were so many instances where I'd forgotten about Game 2 entirely just from how much time the series was dedicating to Game 1. It gets to the point that by the time the B plot finishes up, we're so close to the end of the 12 episode run that the A plot has to work double time just to hit all of its necessary story beats. To further put this into perspective, the events of Game 1 take place over the course of a week or so, maybe a bit more if I had to venture a guess. There's a somewhat tangible flow of time during Game 1. Game 2 takes place over the course of 3 days. 3 days! The flow of time only feels longer because of just how much time the audience spends following Game 1. With King's Game cutting back and forth between the past and the present, the audience is never given time to really connect with any of the characters. There are only a handful of characters whose names I recall at any given moment, and that number includes Nobu. With two separate story arcs having to play out concurrently over a mere 12 episodes, there's no time for growth or character development, which robs the show of any cool moments it could have had. The writers of the anime seem to have taken the Legend of Korra approach, by which I mean instead of placing Nobu and the other characters on an obvious arc, they substitute character development for trauma, and I can't believe I still have to say this, but trauma is not the same as character development. No one is given any room to grow or develop in either group because in Game 1, we know everyone except Nobu dies, so why bother giving them anything beyond surface level traits? And with Game 2, there's just not enough time for anyone to have a believable arc. Not even Nobu gets an actual character arc, and he's the freaking protagonist. The only thing he has going for him is that he's a survivor of a previous King's Game. That is literally his defining trait. If these instances of the King's Game had been separated into their own fleshed out seasons of the show and were told chronologically, many of the moments in Game 2 might actually have been heartfelt or even more tragic. We would have been heavily invested in Nobu as a character, and it would have made sense for him to have the lead role in Game 2. Speaking of Nobu, him being the main character isn't fun to watch. For Game 2, I get that people look to him because he has prior experience with the King's Game, so that makes sense in its own way. But if you ignore the fact that Nobu is literally just a self-insert for the original story's author, there is no reason for the players of Game 1 to look to him to lead and save them. Like, everyone turns to Nobu for the most part, but he's not the strongest, the most cunning, the most popular, nothing. Among the many smooth brains that populate this shit show so densely, there's a character named Rhea who would have been way more interesting if she was the protagonist. She's clever, bold, willing to make hard calls, has a nice design, 
and she's kind of ostracized by her classmates, so watching them learn to depend on her would have been rewarding. But nope, we get stuck with the cardboard cutout that is Nobu. <laughs> The rest of the cast is pretty abysmal too. Between the entirety of the players of games 1 and 2, excluding Rhea, there are maybe 5 brain cells, and that's being incredibly generous. At the end of each episode, there's an end card that shows the number of players that have been killed and the number of players that remain. But why should I care? Anyone that is even remotely likable naturally gets the shaft in increasingly dumb ways, but we'll, we'll get to that when we get to that. And honestly, all of the likable characters are packed into game 1. Game 2 revolves entirely around the antics of Natsuko. The stupidity of the characters is rampant, aggressive, and aggravating. While I can excuse the first portion of Game 1 since they're all kids that aren't taking the game too seriously until it's too late, I can't excuse the frankly absurd idiocy of the kids in Game 2, especially with all the warnings Nobu gives them as a survivor, drawing a stark contrast to how Natsuko approaches the game. If you thought Daenerys Targaryen's flip to the dark side was jarring and abrupt, boy howdy, you'll need to schedule an appointment with a chiropractor after Natsuko starts chewing the scenery. So Natsuko, at the drop of a hat, flips from being the encouraging and tough ally to being this over-the-top cartoonish antagonist. Now that's not to say she's the king, because she isn't. She was just cozying up to Nobu in the hopes that he knew a way out of the game since, as we find out later, she's also a survivor of a previous king's game. Nobu admitting he'd played the game before was just an opportunity she was trying to capitalize on, but it doesn't explain why she was so nice to everyone up until this point. Don't get me wrong, I absolutely adore a good villain, but that villain has to be well written and Nasuko is most certainly not. She makes her whiplash inducing flip to the dark side in episode 2, right after the first episode spent so much of its runtime that could have been spent elsewhere endearing her to the audience. For her to instantly become super spiteful, manipulative, and just downright unpleasant to watch in a bad way, it pulls me right out of the moment. Natsuko checks all of the boxes of bad villain Bingo. Her intolerable presence in this anime is only amplified and highlighted by just how goddamn stupid everyone is. Like at one point, Natsuko literally becomes responsible for inflicting great harm to her supposed best friend and actively gets another player killed but the rest of the group still allows her to travel with them. Like, fam, it's clear as day this chick is going to be a problem for the rest of the game. Why not jump her, tie her up, take her phone, and just leave her to be punished by the king by default? Nasuko is literally the only character that prevents everyone else from working together as a cohesive team, but they never eject her from their circle. It's absolute lunacy. There are some other notable characters, but we'll touch on them when I go through some plot moments that made me want to eat my keyboard. Speaking of the plot, there's one awesome thing that King's Game has going for it, but even that was somehow completely ruined when you stop to examine or think about it. It's the one thing that can get you really hyped for the anime ahead, and that's the OP, or the opening musical number for those of you who aren't weebs. The OP often has the task of selling the vibe of the anime through its musical and visual choices. While King's Game succeeds in its musical choice, it shit the bed so unbelievably thoroughly in terms of its visuals. So let's start with the only good thing about the OP. Somehow, by some miracle of the universe, they managed to secure the rights to use the song Feed the Fire by the band Cold Rain. If that band name rings a bell, it's because they're also responsible for the song Mayday, which was the second OP for Fire Force. They're an incredible band, but that's beside the point. Go check them out though. Feed the Fire is probably my favorite track by that band, because the tone and theme of the song are so well constructed, and the chorus seems pretty well suited to King's Game. <laughs> Where the problems come in is when you actually pay attention to the visuals of the OP because, and I'm not even bullshitting you, the OP literally spoils the entire anime. A lot of anime will find clever and visually interesting ways to hide information about their story arcs in plain sight, but King's Game decided to just play it fast and loose. What is the king? They technically spoil that, but that deserves its own section of this video. Natsuko being unhinged, they spoil that by doing the quintessential villain head tilt and pupil dilation. Nobu eventually teaming up with Riona during game 2, yep they show that. Character deaths, they kinda go above and beyond for this one. They show two class photos, of course from game 1 and game 2, and then red X's appear on the faces of every character that dies. Nobu's face also gets crossed out in the class photo of game 1, but I honestly think that's because he actually does eat shit and die during game 2, and he is crossed out in game 2 as well. But that's not all, because four important characters from game 1 are also shown being swallowed by darkness right after the chorus begins, and one of those characters, Chiemi, who is Nobu's girlfriend, is someone we know for a fact is dead, 
Given Nobu's behavior at the beginning of the series, it's a pretty easy hop to the nearest conclusion, which is they've all been Yamchud. If you had to come up with a word for how dead he is, what would it be? Cadaverific. I'm pretty sure this was done to kind of emphasize the tragedy of the situation, that there's no escaping the King's game for any of the players, but the OP is shown in episode 2. They smartly refrained from running it during episode 1, because that would be complete bullshit. Basically, without knowing it, if you've paid attention to the OP in any capacity, you've essentially spoiled the entire anime for yourself, and what makes it so much shittier is that you don't even really start to realize that until things start happening. It's less of a fun revelation the way it is in shows like My Hero or Mob Psycho 100, and more of a circumstance in which you detach even further from characters because you expect them to die thanks to the OP. Now, we have to talk about the mechanics of the King's Game itself, and how fucking frustrating it is to know how cool this anime could have been. What I was expecting was a nice progression from harmless to dangerous and or fatal in terms of both the tasks from the King, as well as the punishments that result from failure. You could be forgiven if you also assume that the severity of a given punishment would reflect the difficulty of whatever order was assigned to a player. That would make the most sense. If your kid forgot to flush the toilet after taking a shit, you wouldn't then cut off one of his limbs because the offense and the level of retaliation wouldn't match up. Disgusting! King's Game, at just about every turn, refuses to match the severity of the punishment to the difficulty of the task. The King's Game essentially starts off as a death game and mostly stays that way. I say mostly because there are two instances in which the punishments aren't fatal, but there's no reason why the King would backtrack to non-fatal punishments except for the narrative needing it to happen. For example, after the class of Game 1 realize the King's Game is real and start taking it seriously, the class is ordered to conduct a popularity contest between Nobu's best friend and some other chick whose name I can't be bothered to look up, with the loser of the vote having to suffer a punishment. Naturally, the chick loses by like one vote and freaks out because she believes she's going to die, and rightfully so. The class receives the obedience text from the king and it says the chick is going to be punished, but what's weird is that the confirmation that she's going to be punished and her actual punishment come in two separate texts, something that hadn't happened before and, from what I remember, literally never happens again. Because the messages are separate, the chick just assumes she's going to die and throws herself out the fucking window. Everybody do the flop! Right after she does that, her punishment comes in and it was that she had to confess her feelings to the person she likes. This need to make the King's Game relentlessly fatal creates a disconnect very early in the series because the stakes start off sky high and have nowhere else to go after that. When the outcome for every failure is, you died, it really robs the audience of any interesting developments and tension. You become desensitized to the punishments way faster than you would if the punishments started off harmless but soon grew into hellish exercises in physical or emotional trauma before death was even on the table. You'd have more time to connect with the characters over the course of this progression as they started to see that their failures were being punished in increasingly harsh ways. Like, imagine a game of poker where instead of betting money, you had to bet your fingers or teeth. One finger would be worth two teeth, and two teeth would be worth one finger. You could bet with one, the other, or both, but you can't bet more fingers than you have on your body, including ones you've already lost in previous rounds, unless you've won a surplus from other players. Same goes for teeth. At the end of a predetermined number of rounds, any player that concludes the game with less fingers or teeth than they started with would need to personally remove them equal to the deficit they hold. Two teeth could be substituted for one finger, and vice versa. It would be gruesome and horrific to watch, but our characters would still be alive for us to watch them slowly get chipped away at by the King's Game. We'd get to watch this group of classmates playing poker with the deviousness and intensity of an armed standoff. The players would need to pick up on tells, play mind games, count cards, the possibilities are endless with a setup like that, all to avoid being the one in pain. Nothing nearly that clever happens. The punishments, with the exception of two, are nearly always some form of death. It wouldn't even be so bad if the deaths were creative or even unique. The king chooses its punishments the way I choose food when I go out to eat. I find three things that I like and I just cycle between them. While the punishments are pretty shit, the tasks aren't much better. Once the concept of the game was conveyed, I was genuinely curious to see what kind of clever loopholes or out-of-the-box solutions characters could figure out to wriggle out of potentially dangerous tasks. If tasks had more than one solution, it would give each player more characterization if we saw them realize there were multiple ways to technically obey an order. Intelligent players could have been rewarded for their critical thinking and analytical skills. That kind of writing could have made the characters interesting, and we as the audience would have approached each task with a wider perspective to see if we could also think of a plausible way to compete. But when there are no avenues to outsmart the king, when the players have a binary choice with that choice being do or don't, 
the dread of potential tasks becomes non-existent. These bland elements also end up stripping any possible conversations about the grayness of morality out of the story, even more so when just about every character is good by default with the exception of Natsuko. The politics, schemes, and plans would stoke the flames of division and paranoia, layering on even more tension as the class descended further and further into the depths of despair and the inherent sense of self-preservation that would accompany the increasing dangers and risks of betrayal. The forced nature of the Kings game is a perfect arena to truly explore the murkiness of moral choices in the face of bodily harm, trauma, and death. Will you hold on to your ideals if it meant dying? Would you cast your best friend to the wolves to ensure your continued survival? Can you count on your allies to protect you if you become a liability? Could you convince yourself in a split second to endure excruciating pain to survive, even if it meant having to endure even greater suffering the next day? All of these questions and more could have been an exquisite study of human psychology, but the anime is never bold enough to go that route, instead opting to give you the most surface level experience imaginable. A failure to introduce nuanced tasks with some having multiple solutions paired with oops all dead leaves nothing for the audience to chew on so the king's game itself becomes about as boring as watching the home shopping network give you a kiss that is good Mom, that one's got it Whoa! <laughs> okay that was pretty good Stacking onto the shit sandwich of the tasks for a bit longer, there's the issue of vague orders that happen more times than any self-respecting writer would allow. And when I say vague, I do mean vague. Like there's the one I pointed out at the beginning where the king's order to the class is to refrain from doing anything unnecessary. That exact order occurs again, and my problem with it is twofold. The most obvious being that it's a lazy plot device used to thin the herd by leaps and bounds at a moment's notice. When the show needs to drop a ton of nameless or unimportant characters, it goes this route. We don't get to see alliances form and fail, we don't get to see the class fracture into small groups that work against one another before ultimately dying, nothing. The plot just decides there are too many characters and poof, suddenly 5-8 to eight characters are dead. The second issue I have with these vague orders is that even though they're purposely worded so ambiguously, which you'd assume would give the character some wiggle room, the trigger for obedience is extremely specific to the point where it doesn't make sense to be so vague outside of needing to trim down the cast. A good example of this is a task Nobu receives during game 1 that simply says he has to lose something important. It's needlessly vague, but on first watch, I genuinely assumed this would be something easy for him to complete since there are plenty of things anyone could consider important that they'd be heartbroken to lose. I'm sure it's obvious from the fact I even chose this as an example that the game was requiring him to lose something very specific. For additional context, there's a character in game 1 named Nami who low-key has a crush on Nobu for some stupid reason. She's given a unique task that's basically a freebie, with the task being that she has to give herself an order. Any normal person would give themselves something easy to guarantee their safety. Not Nami though, she gives herself the order to touch the king, because she knows that Nobu has a theory that the king might be someone in their class. Naturally, she fails to touch the king because of course the king isn't someone in their class, you fucking glue sniffer. This is the only other instance of a punishment not being fatal. Nami ends up going blind. But back to Nobu's task, with the order to lose something important, he loses track of the blind girl and goes into a panic. So now, as the audience were thinking, oh, I guess that something important was Nami? But earlier in game 1, one of Nobu's friends who was an aspiring musician dies despite Nobu going out of his way to look after him. The kid leaves a bracelet behind that Nobu can be seen wearing during game 1, and after receiving his order to lose something important, fearing the worst for Nami, he proceeds to trash his entire bedroom and even destroys the bracelet from his dead friend. Considering how important that item was, it should have been enough to initiate the obedience text, but it fucking doesn't, which still annoys the shit out of me. The importance of that bracelet should have reached its narrative peak right there, but it literally ended up meaning nothing. Nami decides to drown herself because being blind was harder than she thought it'd be. Was being blind inconvenient? Yeah, I'd imagine so. Was it inconvenient enough to warrant drowning yourself? Probably not. It's her death that gets the obedient text to trigger, something so specific that it should have just been a clear cut task. It's not like the king is above asking one player to kill another anyway. If we pivot from the uninspired and sometimes needlessly vague tasks as well as the criminally unbalanced punishments, we run into a kind of strange issue with the king. It's seemingly all powerful and all knowing, except when the narrative needs it to be dumb or play semantics. There are two examples of this that I want to get into, but in order to do so, I need to explain a task from game 1, the dice game. The penultimate event of game 1 comes down to a single die. The king orders a player to be designated as the roller and after rolling the die, the roller needs to select players equal to the number rolled. The roller then has to speak a player's name. The players selected as well as the roller are then punished. 
Again, I think it's kind of dumb that the roller is also punished, especially when there isn't a shred of character growth to be found. The roller has to select players knowing full well they'll likely die, so also punishing them just seems spiteful on the writer's part. In a better anime, an entire character arc could have been made out of the survivor's guilt of the roller alone, but whatever, I'm getting off topic again. Anyway, Nobu's best friend Naoya decides to be the roller hoping to spare those closest to him. Of course, he rolls a critical failure, and the dice gods decide to give him a 6. At this point in the game, if 7 players died, it would only leave 3. So when it comes time to start selecting players, a character suggests Naoya choose a girl that isn't present because she attempted to kill herself. So she's lying in a hospital in a completely different area. Naoya chastises this character but says his name, which is enough to count as selecting that character for the dice game. The intention of selecting a player was irrelevant. The harsh truth was that all the king required from Naoya was for him to simply speak another person's name. I will say that I do enjoy the concept of an innocent mistake leading to dire consequences, but in that same vein, it shows the audience that as petty as it is, the king isn't above playing semantics. Naoya does go on to say the name of the girl who was asleep in the hospital bed, and despite her being in a completely separate area and being unaware of what's going on with the cast, she still dies. So clearly the king is powerful enough and intelligent enough to register the absence of the player Naoya condemned, still judge her as a viable player, and go kill her anyway. Keep that in mind, we'll circle back around to this after we touch on the issue with semantics. This game of semantics trickles over into game 2 in an obvious way. See, there's an unspoken rule to the king's game that players aren't allowed to block the king. Doing so counts as attempting to drop out partway through, which is one of the game's main rules. So Natsuko, at several points in the story, steals people's phones and uses that as leverage, threatening to use their phone to block the king if they didn't bend the knee to her. She even gets a player killed late in the game by blocking the king in his phone after that player gets the one up on her in a previous group task. I remember being pretty annoyed because the king should be very much aware that it isn't the phone's owner blocking it, but Natsuko. It's the exact same territory of semantics as Naoya accidentally speaking a player's name during the dice game. I understand that sabotage goes hand in hand with concepts like this, but it's a pretty lifeless way to do it, and by this point, you set up the expectation that semantics should be considered. Imagine if a player tried this early on in order to get rid of a classmate they hated, only for the aggressor to be punished. It would still get the point across that blocking the king is a punishable offense, but it would seal off that very dull and obvious path of sabotage. Players with malicious intent would realize that they'd need to be craftier than that in their underhanded tactics. The second issue with the king specifically is how it is portrayed as all-powerful and intelligent, but then is seemingly super stupid. This ties into the... I hesitate to say arc, so we'll just say events surrounding two characters, Mizuki and Kenta. At the beginning of game two, Mizuki receives the order to send the word die to two classmates of her choice. By this point, the reality of the danger had set in for the class. Natsuko has already made her spine snapping flip to the dark side and insists Mizuki send one text to Nobu and the other to Kenta simply because she assumes the two of them are going to be thorns on her side later on. Mizuki, not being a total psychopath, has a freak out and slams her phone to the ground, cracking the screen. Immediately, Natsuko basically says, Welp, without your phone, you're as good as dead. And I remember thinking to myself, why? She could just get a new phone. She has 24 entire hours to get a new phone and send those texts. Any normal person would just shrug and be like, it's whatever, I was due for an upgrade anyway. But they really make a big deal about Mizuki being in danger because of the fact that she broke her phone? Kenta received the order to give himself an order, and he tasks himself with saving Mizuki's life. While he does this as a way of boosting her morale, the moment he said that, my brain went, They're dead. Two kids gonna die tonight. Kenta and Mizuki listen to Nobu tell the story of Game 1 while they travel to an old town where the very first King's game was played, hoping to find answers on how to bring the game to an end without any more death. They're under this impression thanks to the research done by a character that dies during Game 1, who discovered the existence of the village but also that those who die during the game are sent follow-up texts containing one letter. Even with that character's investigation and contribution, I don't know why Nobu jumps to the conclusion that there's a solution hidden in that old village just because the first known King's game took place there. There's a plot twist in the village, but neither that nor the investigation of the village matter at all in the grand scheme of things, and I'm not even kidding. Nobu discovers that Natsuko is the sister to his dead girlfriend, and he discovers that their father was also looking into the king's game, with the only helpful knowledge written down being that the king would leave one letter behind with each victim. But in terms of the anime's structure, we were literally just told this by another character, so that's fun. And the Natsuko family reveal only ever comes up one time, and never has a direct effect on the story or how she interacts with Nobu. 
This kind of surface level twist is basically the equivalent of the phone call was coming from inside the house the entire time, except the owner of the house has already moved out, rendering the reveal of the phone call utterly pointless outside of someone later mentioning that they knew what a phone looked like once. Why bother taking me to this stupid village and making the sister reveal when both of those things are ultimately irrelevant? Anyway, on their way to the village, Mizuki does get another phone, and I'm pretty sure the show goes so far as to convey that she still has the same phone number. But despite this, she still technically fails because, and I can only assume, she doesn't do her task from her original phone. If she kept her phone number the same, the king should still be able to contact her, keeping her a viable player. Hell, the king was able to kill the chick in the hospital despite her not hearing her name being selected during the dice game or even seeing her punishment text, which does matter and I'll explain when we get to what the king is here in a second. But Mizuki going from an iPhone to an Android was enough to stump the big bad king? What's even dumber is that because of this absolutely dog shit writing, Kenta, one of the only likable characters, also dies because if you remember, he tasked himself with saving her life, so when she failed, he failed. With all that in mind, let's look at something like No Game No Life, an anime with problems of its own that has very similar concepts but handles them with far more nuance. The main protagonist and his little sister are a pair of gamers that never lose and are transported to an alternate reality where murder and robbery are forbidden, so literally every conceivable problem that can't be solved through diplomacy is resolved through games where each side wagers something that they both agree is of equal value. This can range anywhere from the clothes on their backs to their lifelong loyalty to even control of an entire kingdom. However, each resident of this world is bound by 10 core tenants that keep the playing field level. The rules are just vague enough that playing semantics is a viable strategy. For example, one of the rules states that being caught cheating is grounds for an instant loss. The protagonist cheats during an early game and rationalizes that because he wasn't caught cheating, he technically hasn't broken any rules and according to the rules, he's right. Because we later see him facing off against an opponent he knows for a fact is cheating, but unless he can prove she is, she technically hasn't broken any rules. This takes the idea of semantics and organically works it into the world in a way that makes sense, forcing players of all types to think on their feet knowing that how a player words their wager or the rules genuinely matters. No Game No Life also has a pretty good progression of difficulty and consequences. This is made smoother by the fact that A, as I said, the parties involved all have to agree that what they're wagering is equivalent. And B, one of the tenets of the world is that the one challenged has the right to decide the rules of the game, adding yet another layer of strategy to each situation. Each battle becomes a chessboard for the characters to carefully think through, and by how the characters approach these conflicts, they're given characterization. The show isn't dark like King's Game is though, in fact, it's very bright and colorful and genuinely pretty funny at times, but mechanically, it does what King's Game is trying to do, but the execution is far, far cleaner. It doesn't take an astrophysicist to see that the King's Game fails on pretty much every single level. The characters are flat and borderline infuriating to watch, the plot ping pongs back and forth between two timelines so the pacing is the equivalent of having your car flip down the highway, and all the tasks and punishment somehow have less intrigue than a suburban dad telling you about his World War II model planes. With all of these bullshit twists and turns, all of these almost interesting threads and arcs that are taken behind the barn and euthanized with a shotgun, what on earth is even left for the audience to stick around for? <laughs> The only thread left to tug on are the questions that have been there from the very start of the anime. Who is the king, and how do you stop the game? If there was still a single bone in your body that was excited for these revelations, or hoping for, at the very least, a satisfying answer, your optimism is admirable. Let's start with who is the king, because this leads directly into answering how the game can be stopped. As I said before, the OP spoiled the answer to this. I bet a few eagle-eyed people went to watch the OP and found the answer, but if you didn't, let me point it out to you. This slide in the OP right behind me is the king. As revealed to us by Rhea after the conclusion of the dice game, the king's game, and stay with me here, is a sentient, biological virus that somehow managed to infect computer networks in order to perpetuate more instances of the king's game. Yes, you heard that correctly, the king is a computer virus. Your next logical question might be, wait, if it's a computer virus, how in the actual hell is it able to kill the players? I'm glad you asked. See, there's a phenomenon in hypnosis in which welts can be raised on the human skin without that person having been touched through the power of suggestion. Rhea reveals that the researchers believe the suggestions of the King's Game themselves were a type of infectious disease. The punishments of the King's Game operate through the concept of the power of suggestion taken to a ridiculously illogical extreme. If that's still a bit confusing, let me give you an example of how this works when it's in action. A player becomes infected with the King's Game virus when they're drawn into the game via the initial text. This suggestion is planted immediately through the Third Order, which states that if a player doesn't follow an order, they'll be punished. 
Let's say our hypothetical player fails to obey their order. The punishment text comes in and says something like, this player will be punished via death by dismemberment. The punishment text is the trigger which activates the steroid fueled power of suggestion. That player, especially after witnessing other people die, would genuinely believe they're going to be dismembered, further strengthening the suggestion's ability to enact harm. It's their own belief in the suggestion that causes their body to harm itself and split into pieces like a bad polyamorous breakup. Just about every character we've seen in the anime has been shown to receive and read their own punishment text, lending itself to the idea that doing so is crucial to how this iteration of the power of suggestion works. However, if you recall, there was the girl in the hospital that had attempted to kill herself. If the king's punishment works through the power of suggestion, this character should have needed to be aware of the fact she was going to be punished for the virus in her body to trigger. But it looks like she's asleep when the punishment text comes in, so that already shoots a massive hole in the story's explanation of how this all works. She should have been just fine until the moment came when she was made aware of her impending punishment via reading the text from the king. The same is true for Mizuki too, who had just woken up and hadn't even seen her punishment text but died anyway. Same goes for the students that were killed retroactively at the beginning of the game for simply being asleep. Otherwise, you're asking me to believe that the trigger can still be tripped by other players independent of the victim's knowledge. By all accounts, their own explanation of how the King's Game function doesn't match up to their own portrayal of it because it seems like the writers lack an adequate understanding of the power of suggestion. In a better written anime, this might have been a cool twist, but it leaves so many stupid questions after an already infuriating story that it only drags the product down as a whole even further. After Rhea reveals all of this to us, she attempts to destroy all instances of the King's Game on the network with an antivirus program, but we as the audience know that she fails because the entire sequence occurs in a flashback. When she inevitably fails, the King punishes her by setting her on fire, but she doesn't die right away or even acknowledge that she's on fire. She just keeps casually typing and talking to Nobu while doing her best bonfire cosplay. The fire is burning hot enough to destroy her clothes and melt her shoes, but her hair and skin remain completely intact. She has time for an entire monologue before she throws herself into a ravine or something. It's incredibly stupid in an anime that wants so desperately to be taken seriously, but honestly her standing there casually chatting while she's literally on fire is probably the most anime thing to happen in the show. Nobu's girlfriend essentially kills herself so that she doesn't have to kill him, leaving him as the only player left in game 1. Then we find out that the final task of game 1 was for Nobu to choose between receiving a punishment or continuing the king's game. This is incredibly important for our next point, so just keep this choice in the back of your mind. Let's go ahead and skip right to the end of game 2 because the stuff leading up to it is mostly unimportant. After being forced to run for nearly 24 hours to get to a remote, abandoned estate in the mountains, an order comes in for the remaining 5 to sever enough limbs to create a human doll. Of course, there just so happens to be a perfectly pristine chainsaw nearby for just such an occasion. One of the characters suddenly goes batshit crazy and attempts to remove his limbs, but dies after severing one leg. There's some extra context to that, but trust me, it doesn't matter. Natsuko kills a chick that I genuinely forgot was even there, leaving just her, Nobu, and a character named Riona. Over the course of Game 2, these three were all secretly collecting the mysterious texts left behind on the phones of the dead players from the king. Nobu finally gets Natsuko to shut up long enough to explain the situation, combining the texts from Game 2 with the ones that he collected from Game 1. They pull their findings together and discover how to bring the King's Game to a permanent end. In order for the King's Game to end, every player in the current game has to die. As long as even one of them survives, the King's Game will continue until all of humanity is destroyed. This ties back to the end of Game 1 and how Nobu chose to continue the King's Game out of self-preservation. His continued survival is what ultimately led to the deaths of his new classmates. It drives home the virus aspect of the plot twist by making the survivor a carrier of the King's Game in a way. Props where it's due, I do like this very specific segment of the revelation because it draws a clear line from cause to effect and how so many lives could have been spared if Nobu had just chosen to die. It's also a clever way for the King's Game to guarantee its own continued existence by leveraging the threat of death over the survivor player and essentially forcing them into agreeing to keep the King's Game going. I said this so many times already, but in a better written show, this could have been a gut-wrenching and genuinely bleak revelation. By this point, I just wanted everyone to die so I could finally stop watching. Being the annoyingly antagonistic character she is, Natsuko refuses to give up her life in the way Nobu and Riona appear reluctantly willing to do so. The ending of this really cements why I hate Natsuko's character, because it could have been so incredibly compelling if done differently and with a bit more patience. She spouts off some bullshit about needing to be the bad guy, but that's exactly my point. There didn't need to be a bad guy. 
the antagonist was already the king and his orders. Think of how much more intense the show would have been if everyone agreed to work together from the very start, only for the games themselves to slowly pull them apart and break them down until their bonds with each other had also begun fracturing. Natsuko could have had an awesome, slow burn story arc that turned her from the bubbly character that encouraged everyone to the sociopath only concerned with her own survival. The transformation over time would have made the ending far more intense and could have led to some genuinely compelling dialogue, but with games 1 and 2 being mashed together there was no time to give her any true characterization. Natsuko eventually gets run through with the chainsaw by Riona, but somehow doesn't die and instead waits until there's a lull in the conversation to grab the chainsaw, get up off the ground, and slice Nobu's throat without either one of them noticing. How? So yeah, Nobu bites the dust, but not before telling Riona to survive, knowing full well that her survival would mean others would be subjected to another instance of the King's game. You're giving me mixed signals here, Nobu. Make up your goddamn mind. Nobu wakes up in what I can only assume is heaven where his dead girlfriend and classmates are all waiting. But I have to ask the obvious question, how the fuck did Natsuko get into heaven? Riona drowns herself with Nobu's body, so you'd think that would conclude the King's game, right? No one else has to suffer through this abomination, right? There's a whole ass post credit scene that sets up for a possible sequel with another round of the King's game initiating. How? I have no fucking idea, by this anime's own logic the game should be over. There's even to be continued text left as an end card. They legitimately thought they were going to get a sequel, which, given the teaser, was likely to follow the events of Annihilation, an instance of the King's Game in which every high school student in Japan is forced to participate. I honestly had to make sure there wasn't a second season of this show that snuck out under my nose, and thank god there wasn't, because lord knows the last thing I wanted to do was subject myself to more King's Game. During the entirety of my second watch in preparation for this video, I kept telling myself, it's easy to complain, but what would you do to make it better? I thought about this throughout the duration of my second watch, and an answer dawned on me during a moment when I jokingly said out loud, where are all the fucking adults? You'd think, with tons of kids from the same class dropping dead from heart attacks, hangings, and other gruesome ways, that at some point, parents, teachers, and the authorities would get involved. Then I realized, that's how you fix the plot. First of all, you need to give this a 24 episode run or something to allow every character room to breathe and develop an actual personality. You have the A plot and the B plot running concurrently during the same period of time and then have them converge when it makes sense to. The A plot would follow a class of characters who are all having their first experience with the King's game. No survivors of former games, no prior knowledge of how the game works. They need to think cleverly and try to outwit not only the king, but each other as friendships started breaking down and their morality was put to the test. That half of the plot would entirely be them just wrapping their heads around the king's game and trying to survive as the tasks and punishments grew in intensity until bodies did start dropping. I don't imagine it would take too many corpses for the police to get involved, especially when the victims were all from the same classroom. The B-plot would be the police or a handful of detectives investigating the deaths and trying to piece together what the hell was happening. To make it even more interesting, what if the student's parents could be a detective that's part of the active investigation? Through his work, he would realize that it's a new instance of the King's Game because, plot twist, the detective himself would have been a survivor of a previous King's Game. Ah oh, shit, here we go again. This is where I would also kind of lean into the ending plot twist of the original story, but change it from a virus into a transmissible curse. If we link the King's Game to the workings of a debilitating curse, we can give the King more flexibility in terms of semantics and it would explain how the game manages to kill its players, particularly those who are unconscious or otherwise out of commission. The source and origin of this curse would come from the malicious spirit of a Japanese peasant that was dragged away from his family and forced to participate in grueling, gruesome, and often fatal court games for the amusement of a particularly brutal shogun. The peasant would have died in horrible agony during one of these instances after surviving so much in hopes of finally being set free. This despair and hatred would anchor the peasant to the moral plane I'm angry about this! where he would latch onto groups of people and subject them to the same horrors he endured. Over the hundreds of years the peasant has been forcing people to endure the king's game, he's had a bird's eye view of the evolutions of technology and gained a better understanding of social dynamics and psychology, leading to more compelling tasks both individually and in groups. Japan is particularly superstitious when it comes to curses and bad omens, so this angle will really lend itself to a kind of life horror, a subcategory of horror I touch on in one of my videos that you should check out. It would also add a touch of irony to know that the king's game was run by the spirit of a peasant. In a flashback, we'd have the detective narrate his experience with the King's Game, and he'd come to the same choice as Nobu. 
but this time with the spirit of the peasant forcing him into choosing between punishment or the perpetuation of the king's game. We take it a step further by adding a narrative layer of guilt by having the king further explain what he means. The detective himself would become exempt from the king's game in exchange for harboring the curse and passing it on to someone else, which would then initiate another instance of the death game. The detective would walk away with his life, but he would be condemning potentially countless people to suffering at the hands of the king. This would give the detective his own burdens to bear and give us insight into why he chose to go on to become a detective, hoping that he could atone for his choice to perpetuate the king's game by saving lives and serving justice. But the tragedy of the choice would be that while he was immune from the king's game, that immunity would not extend to his friends or family, so there was always the possibility that the king's game could come back to haunt him as it ends up doing when his kid's classroom is drawn into an instance of it. It becomes a story about the grayness of morality among the students and the far-reaching consequences of one's actions for the detective. We can take even that a step further into the bleakness of humanity by how I'd end the anime, which would be the detective's kid ends up becoming the survivor thanks to the kindness of some of their friends as well as the questionable actions of the detective behind the scenes. But the detective's kid is then given the same choice, death or perpetuating the king's game in exchange for immunity from future games. Being someone that witnessed the suffering and despair, the detective's kid decides that the king's game needs to end, even though that means death. Not to mention the student, after having done so much to survive, is barely recognizable to their father. So the king gives the surviving student their punishment. They must end their own life in front of their father with his service pistol. If the student doesn't go through with it, the king will still grant immunity to them and the king's game will begin anew as the curse is passed on. If the student does go through with it but fails to do so in front of their father, the curse will be transferred back to the detective and he'll be the one to pass the game on to a new group. This ending would be designed to make the audience and characters think about each outcome while emphasizing the importance of actions and consequences, bringing the detective's decisions all those years ago full circle. If the student kills themselves in front of their father with a service pistol, that forever taints the job he chose as a direct result of wanting to help people after surviving the King's game. It would break the man's spirit losing his kid to the King's game, and his service weapon would be a constant reminder of the fact that he's tangentially responsible for it. He would very likely leave his job behind, the job, mind you, he took in order to save lives as a way of atoning for keeping the game going. If the student doesn't go through with it, then they are also saddled with the burden of knowing they're condemning countless others to suffering and death, as well as the permanent physical, emotional, and mental scars they've accrued during their trials, while also being living proof that the King's game could eventually circle back to bring more pain to their doorstep even if they're exempt from participating. The best part is that I'd leave the ending ambiguous. I wouldn't tell the audience which option the character chose because it's more about the implications of each choice than the choice itself. The last frame of the series would just be a father and his teenage kid standing on opposite sides of a table with a handgun sitting on top of it. No music, no dialogue, just the two staring at the gun, then at each other, then cut to black. I know that was bleak as hell, so here, have a nice video of a dog being a dog. Again, my rework of the show was incredibly grim, but that's the level of storytelling a concept like King's Game could have given us. I thought that up in the span of watching a few episodes, so you can't tell me that a better story wasn't possible. I guess I had way more to say about King's Game than I originally thought. I'm a sucker for a great concept because my brain goes into overdrive thinking of all the amazing paths that it could take narratively. It's why I'm such a huge fan of D&D. A small prompt can turn into a world-shattering revelation if it's pursued and iterated upon with care and patience. I haven't read any of the King's Game novels, so I can't say whether or not they're better than the anime we got, but they certainly can't be worse. I'm almost tempted to read them all, but if they're genuinely good stories, I know it'll just piss me off even more. This entire endeavor started off as a joke to amuse myself with for a video, but it made me realize just how much I hate seeing a good premise get completely wasted. A concept like this could have easily become a masterpiece, but so many of the pieces of the puzzle were too small, in the wrong place, from the wrong puzzle, or just missing entirely. It stops being funny when you can see glimpses of a good story buried under mountains of horseshit. And at that point, once the frustration wears off, it just becomes sad. Part of me was considering making an entire series about finding, watching, and reviewing objectively terrible anime, but I think King's Game really took the legs out from- I mean hung me out to dr- I mean bled all the fu- Oh for fuck's sake, whatever. Don't watch King's Game, or do, I'm not your dad, but you'll hate yourself if you go through with it. Anyway, I've talked long enough. I had zero intention of turning what was supposed to be a snarky review into a rage fueled video essay, but here we are. If you sat all the way through this, holy shit I love you. 
If you didn't sit all the way through this, I bet you tuck your shirt into your pants when you go to sleep, you fucking dweeb. Before we go, I just want to say two things. The first being that the Discord server is now live, and you can join via the link in the pinned comment. I'm very active on Discord, so that's the place to be if you want to suggest video ideas, see what I've got on the roster, ask about progress on videos, or just chat with other like-minded nerds about things we collectively enjoy. Lastly, I'm going to take a break from the monthly upload schedule so that I can really work on two video essays I've been meaning to do, one of which will of course be the Chapter Black video, and the second will be about one of my favorite games of all time. So after this video, I do still have one more in the works for May, but I'm going to take the summer to really hammer out these video essays. Being this type of YouTuber while simultaneously lacking a personal video editor to share the workload with is incredibly difficult to balance with the rest of my life, so I hope you guys can be understanding. At any rate, I appreciate you all, be safe, be kind to yourself and others, and as always, thanks for watching.